As Kim was saying, we've got a passage here that deals with worry, and all of us are prone to worry from time to time about our finances, our health, our vocations, politics, taxes, inflation, fill in the blank, war in Ukraine. And my name is Dave Householder, blessed to be your Bible teacher, and get your Bibles out if you would and turn to Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, verse 17 and following, whether that's on your phone or on a print Bible, whatever it is, we're going to cover a big piece of chapter 5. We normally just do a few verses, but there's a unified story here, so we have to tell the whole story of what's going on. And the passage, the title is, Is This of God? Acts 5, 17 through 42. When people do things and claim that it's of God and it doesn't sit right with us, what do we do about that? Who thinks there's a diversity of opinions on this planet about who God is and what God's up to? I mean, that's just obviously true. There's a lot of disagreement, even within churches themselves. When people do or say things you don't like, what do we do about it? Do we worry? Do we stew? Do we react? What do we do? Is this of God? And we're going to bring forth a Bible character that is underrated. In fact, I think people, if they have boys... They should use this name because this name is a a fantastic Bible hero that changed the course of history and he's unknown to most of us. So we're going to look at examples of when people say or do things that bother us, especially if they do it in the name of God, but they can do it any way that kind of bugs us. Here's some examples. Political opinions that seem off to you. You hear somebody voice an opinion and it just hits you wrong in the stomach. You just think that's just not true. That's just not right. There's something off about that. Who's ever smelled food and it just smelled a little off? You just think it's the same with uh, political opinions that people have from time to time. News that is spun. This is a new thing. I, I grew up and news was rather objective and now it depends on which cable channel you look at. It tends to be spun like crazy. And you start to think, okay, what should I do about this? Should I worry? Should I panic? What should I do about the fact that this is just off? Decisions at your workplace that seem unfair. Who's ever had a boss that did something you didn't like or said something you didn't like? The stuff that just didn't feel right, didn't sit right, what do you do about that? Or if you've been going to school, teachers saying things counter to your instincts. Your instincts are going, wait a minute, I'm not so sure. And what should I do about this? I get phone calls from students. And this, my teacher wants, to say, wants me to say this in my essay, but I feel it's wrong. What should I do? I'll probably get a bad grade if I disagree with the teacher. I get those phone calls from time to time. Or church denominational politics or false teaching. You only have to go on YouTube to uh, look up this passage in the Bible, and you'll, he'll, you'll hear all kinds of different things on this passage, and every passage. What do we do about what we consider to be false teaching or stuff that just smells a little bit off. And church, uh, <laughs> church denominational politics, those kinds of things, you just think, what's going on here? What do we do about these things? And I get a lot of people posting that they're nervous, worried, and panicked about these things. Well, the apostles once again went out and preached in the name of Jesus. And they got called back into the principal's office again. And some of you have been called into the principal's office when you were growing up. I still remember Mr. Deering in junior high. And Mr. Deering used to put you on a little stool in the corner. And he would sit at his desk busily working. And he had a spinning chair like this one. And he would spin around real quick and be right in your face. And you just had this all kind of figured out how to, uh, how to do this. And my principal in grade school, Mr. Copel, and we had a song about him. Over land, over sea, over Mr. Mr. Copel's knee, yes, a spanking is coming to me. That was back in the days when principals still spanked people. We had a paddle sitting up there, and uh, it was used frequently. So they're called into the principal's office for what? Speaking in the name of Jesus at Solomon's portico. I'm going to walk you through the storyline, and then we're going to focus in on some key passages here in the story. Acts 5, 17 through 42. Verses 12 through 16. The apostles became celebrities at Solomon's Colonnade, a big crowded public area. Who heard the terrible news about 
about uh, South Korea yesterday where they had a whole bunch of people crushed. Crowded area, kind of like that. You know, just a lot of people moving through a small space. And so there's a big crowded area. The apostles are showing up and they're healing people. And this time, this is the second time around, and so they're becoming celebrities. They're becoming like rock stars. People want the shadow of one of the apostles to fall on them. And Tamara preached about that last week, 12 through 16. Then the empire strikes back. The Sadducees uh, put them in prison because they told them not to preach in the name of Jesus, and they went out and did it anyways. So the powers that be, the religious powers, the Romans, the Jews, all those folks, they conspired to put them back in jail. The angel, in verse 19 through 20, intervened. An angel came around and let them out of prison and told them, and this was Tamara's message last week, her title, Go Stand and Speak Words of Life. Get back out there and do it again. Go back out and do what they told you not to do. There's a time to obey our rulers. There's a time to follow the laws, and there's a time to say no to that. The Bible says for everything there is a season. There's a time to resist the government, and there's a time to obey the government. And sometimes it's hard to know which is which, especially when there's punishment involved and there's something to be paid. Then in verses 21 through 27, bigwigs send for the captives. They're in jail. We're going to send for them and bring them into the principal's office, and we're going to, we're going to tell them what for. We're going, to, we're going to take care of this once and for all because they're not paying attention, they're not obeying, they're not conforming. And they get a big surprise. They go to the jail, and guess what? They're not there. They're not there. And uh, the prison's locked, and the guards didn't see anything happen. You might think, well, that doesn't happen. People, I'm sure that uh, some of you heard this too, probably Tamara and some other people, but uh, people often say to me, Pastor, I don't want you to think I'm weird, but this happened. <laughs> Most people have those experiences that are, cannot be explained by anything else. Even people outside the church often have experiences which make no sense except for angelic intervention. I've heard of people who've had people come help them on the side of the road and then vanish. You know, that kind of thing. It just it happens all the time. Angelic intervention is something which you've probably had happen to you and you've probably suppressed the memory because you don't want people to think you're weird. Acts 5, verses 28 and following. They get called into the principal's office. They are unrepentant. What happens to people that are unrepentant? They get a harsher sentence. They get a harsher sentence. And pretty much the consensus is it's time for the death penalty because these people are never going to listen. So things are getting what? Escalated or de-escalated? Escalated. People are getting hot-headed. You know, let's just kill them. Let's just kill them all. So much for free speech. Let's kill them all. And the Pharisee Gamaliel intervenes, verses 34 through 39, and that's what we're going to focus on in just a moment. And this is the guy I told you about. This is the guy that I think we should name our kids after. This guy is pivotal in the story of Acts and incredibly wise. Then verses 41 through, oh, excuse me, 40, <laughs> they still get a beating, which is just terrible. Uh, they get a beating and they get set free. So they get a little flogging, and, uh, and off they go. So the death penalty is averted because of who? Gamaliel. Gamaliel, Gamaliel <laughs> saves them from the death penalty. And we're going to hear why he did it and how he did it. And it gives, right, it gives rise to something called the Gamaliel Principle in Ethics, which is still out there today and talked about in philosophical circles. Then there was rejoicing and ignoring authority again, verses 41 through 42. We're just going to keep on doing what we're doing because we got off it. Uh, we got off this thanks to Gamaliel, and God protected us with angels. He protected us with Gamaliel, and he's going to protect us as a movement. So let's look at Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a sage, S-A-G-E. And I'm doing translations for the Passion Translation. My next book up is Zechariah. They just gave it to me yesterday, so I've got to go through Zechariah and uh, go through the draft that's been put together based on the Hebrew and all that stuff. And here's what happened. There was a time when the prophets were a really big deal. Who can name some of the prophets? Ezekiel, Joel, Joel Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, those guys. Ezra. Ezra. The prophets who would speak forth 
in the name of God. Please repeat after me. Prophets are not fortune tellers. They are forth tellers. They speak forth. The word in Hebrew for prophet is navi, N-A-B-I, navi, and B and V are sort of the same in Hebrew. So a navi is somebody who speaks for God, and it's the same word for bubbler. He bubbles up. Uh, somebody whose words come up inside of the prophet, or him or her, there's female prophets too, the people who speak for God. Repeat after me, a prophet is a mouthpiece for God. Okay, prophets speak what God gives them. They often do it reluctantly. They don't want to share what God gives them, and they often try to get away and travel away, like, like Jonah. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to share this. And virtually all of them protest at some point. I don't want to say what you want me to say. Prophets speak forth in the name of God. Well, around the time of 300 or so B.C., so the Old Testament is winding up to a close, the prophets stop prophesying. Alexander the Great takes over, the Greeks take over the whole known world. And at the end of the age of the prophets, and it's the beginning of the age of the sages, the scholars, the people who footnote the prophets. They're not people who speak for God, but they're people who, based on precedence, give rulings and have discussions on what God has done in the past. So the age of the prophets was followed by the age of the sages. And in Jewish tradition, that age is still going on. If you have a rabbi, they will get together and they will argue over things and they'll discuss the scriptures and they'll try to apply it to daily life based on everything that's been said. So there's prophets and sages. The prophets were replaced by sages. And Gamaliel is one of the greatest of the sages. It's one of those people who looks at all of Scripture and creates balanced rulings based on that. And there were great sages like Hillel, Gamaliel, a whole bunch of them. All the way, the last 2,000 years, there's been a whole bunch of them. So he's one of the big ones. So you, you ask a Jewish rabbi what they think of Gamaliel. It's, he's up on Mount Rushmore of the sages, definitely, to this day. Gamaliel also was the mentor for a certain person in the Bible who's kind of important. He was a mentor for the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel for years. Now, Paul was a little testy as a young man and had some ego issues, but he grew out of them, and the teaching of Gamaliel sort of came up through him later in life. And that wisdom kind of came through Paul later on. Early on, he often didn't get it. Some young men are kind of, you know, full of spit and vinegar like Paul was, and he finally settled down a little bit and became more like his mentor, Gamaliel. So Gamaliel not only saved the hides of the apostles, he also mentored Paul. So who thinks he's kind of a big deal in the New Testament? So it, it, Paul wrote half the New Testament, so this is kind of a big deal. So Gamaliel stands up because he realizes they're about to lynch the apostles. They're about to die. And you don't want to get a crowd in the Middle East upset about someone or the rocks start flying to this day. To this day. I was watching on the news two nights ago, the protests in Iran. Death to the mullahs. And if they got into power, guess what they would do? Kill the mullahs. That's just, things get worked up in the Middle East. And that's just how their culture is kind of hot-headed. And they're not Californians. People in the Middle East often don't say, it's all good, it's all good, Come on, it's all good. But Gamaliel stands up because he realizes he has to intervene here because things are getting out of control. So let's look at what he does. So my advice is, leave these men alone. And this sounds really counterintuitive to the, the, the principal's office people, the people in charge, the Sanhedrin. Let them go. If they're planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it's from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. The others accepted his advice and called the apostles, had them flogged, rather than 
stoned. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go, which, of course, they just kept doing. Verse 41, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah. So here you have what we call the Gamaliel principle. Why am I bringing this up? Because it's still very apropos today. We live in a pluralistic world where people are doing a lot of different things. And it's our temptation to get hot and bothered about it. And if we were in charge, we would shut it down. We're not in charge, so we can't. But there's a temptation to worry, as Kim was saying. Try to do something. Find a political solution. Try to force or argue people, argue against people that we don't like especially if they're speaking for God. And people are saying all kinds of things in the name of God. What do we do about it? And one of the wisest things we can do is to apply the Gamaliel principle. Now, here's the problem. You have to trust that God is in charge if you want to apply it. Let me say that again. You have to trust that God is in charge if you want to imply the principle. Because, can we shut this door? I think there's going to be a lot of noise coming through here. The Methodists had a very short service, and so uh, they're going to get our chili all ready for us. Here's what I mean. Repeat after me this phrase, the sovereignty of God. That is the belief that God is in charge. Oh, you, you, can, you can stop now. It's just... Uh, that is the belief that God is in charge. To intervene all the time and try to fix things or try to stop other people from disagreeing with you or try to, to, to shut down people speaking falsely in some ways is a form of agnosticism. I don't believe God's going to intervene, so I'm going to have to. You say that again. I don't believe God's really in charge. I don't believe he might not even be there. And since we have this opinion and they have that opinion, the only way to stop them is through human means. Now, to believe in the sovereignty of God, we have to trust that God is in charge. And trusting that God is in charge is hard for us. And based on your level of believing that, if you really believe God is in charge, you're not going to worry about anything. Most of us struggle to believe that God is in charge. And we try to intervene on our own. But if you believe that God's not in charge, then we better do something. We've got to do something. Otherwise, people might say bad things about God, and that might take off. But the truth is, God has always protected his flock. Throughout history, it's the remnant that has always been blessed. The faithful remnant, the people that are really speaking for God and actually seeking his will, have always been blessed and have always succeeded. In 587 B.C., the city of Jerusalem was flattened in the time of Jeremiah. You know what Jeremiah said? Go buy property in Jerusalem. Go buy property in Babylon. Plant trees. It's going to be okay as long as we're faithful. Because guess who's in charge? Did it look like God was in charge? Absolutely not. It looked like the Babylonians were in charge. And we're talking just a few thousand people left that were faithful at this point. Left over from all of Israel, David, Solomon, the whole deal. And yet God blessed those people. God will always bless the faithful remnant. And if God's going to bless the faithful remnant, our main job is not to shut down other people. Our main job is to remain as faithful as possible. And to stick to what God is saying, no matter what other people are saying. The more faithful we remain, and the more we trust in the providence of God, and the more we trust in the sovereignty of God, the more God is going to bless us and preserve us. There's a fraction of the amount of people going to church that were going to church before the pandemic. This is true all across the country. Should we worry about that? Well, we want to invite more people into church, and we're going to invite everybody to the Alpha Course on January the 18th in the whole neighborhood. 
and we want to do something, but do we, should we worry about that? No, because God is what? In charge, and God will bless the remnant. God is going to bless the remnant. Our job is not to fix other people. Our job is to remain as faithful as possible, even if it costs us. And the apostles were willing to do that. They were probably willing to die for this. That's commitment to God's sovereignty and to the principle of Gamaliel, which really, who thinks the world would be a whole lot better if people would just relax? I think he's a closet Californian. You know, just, uh, just let people do what they do and God will bless what he's going to bless. And he's, it's, the stuff that isn't of God is going to be worn out. Situations. Campaign flyers. Oh my goodness. Have you ever seen, you know, I, I don't want to touch them, they're so slimy. And I, I don't care if you're a, a conservative or a liberal, there's slimy stuff in your mailbox. So-and-so eats children, you know, so-and-so eats children with salsa. You know, they go back and forth, it's just, it's just awful stuff, making each other to be like satanic, awful people, and it's just silly. We could get all worried about that, which I kind of am right now, I've got to calm down, because God is in charge. God is in charge. Oversimplifying public figures. You know, either Kamala Harris or, or Nancy Pelosi or Donald Trump is the great Satan or Putin is in charge. You know, people. The line between good and evil runs down the middle of each of us, not between us and them. And we have to feed the good side of us and remain faithful and starve the bad side of us. Who here does not have the line between good and evil running down the middle of them? Except for John Ellis, of course, because John is pretty perfect. But... Uh, it, just kidding, John. Just in case you have no sense of humor, I didn't mean that. It was just, uh, we oversimplify stuff out there. None of these people are all good or all bad. They're all a mixed bag, just like who? You and me. And we want to grow the faithful part of us and starve the unfaithful part, and it might cost us. It might cost us our lives. It might cost us jail time. It might cost us our fortunes. I love what... Uh, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, they said, you know, and to this we sign our, our lives, our families, and our sacred honor, or something like that. Because they, if they'd lost the revolution, guess what would happen to them? They'd be strung up. The key is not to fix other people. The, the key is to be willing to be strung up for the truth. I'm not asking you to be passive. I'm act asking you to be active. And to be just be searching for truth all the time. And ask yourself if you have an opinion. Is this just an opinion that benefits me, or is this something that God's really saying? Is this something that God's really saying to me? Because it's probably not a safe opinion. One person once said to me back at Holden Village, I just was a, it was a great talk, I don't remember who it was, but if you want to follow Jesus, make sure you look good on wood. Make sure you look good on wood, because it might cost you. So I'm not asking you to be passive, I'm asking you to... Seek after holiness. Seek after, after truth. And it's, it's, a, it's quite an adventure, I'll tell you that. The book of Acts, the reason it's called Acts is because they were doing things. That's why it's called Acts. And some of you are bored with life. You want to follow Jesus, you will not be bored. They had shipwrecks, floggings. They were sawn in two. I mean, all kinds of stuff, but it wasn't boring. I mean, it was pretty... It was, <laughs> It was, it was an exciting life. There was, there was an edge to it. Cable news and talk radio. You know, we can get all hot and bothered about what our, our enemy cable news channel is saying, or talk radio. Gossip about false teaching churches. I find myself doing this all the time. You know what they're teaching. They're teaching ha, ha, ha. You know. um, when I should be working on my own what? My own faithfulness. How faithful am I, and how can I be more faithful, and how can I act on it, even if it costs me? Apocalyptic doomsday scenarios. People have these doomsday scenarios. And I tell you, as a pastor, I get emails all week long from people with apocalyptic doomsday scenarios. But what they're saying is God's not really in charge. We better worry. That's the underlying thing. Tin hat conspiracies. You know, I wish some of these conspiracies were true because they're kind of cool and fun. But people aren't smart enough for conspiracies, people. They really aren't. I've interviewed in my radio show the people running this country, 
and they're no smarter than any of us. They're just really good at getting elected. Believe me, they're very average. They're not smart enough to run a conspiracy running the world. There's nobody in the back pulling strings. They wouldn't even know what string to pull. I mean, you'd be, you'd be shocked sometimes at how little the people in charge really know. And a lot of them just got there by sheer luck. Just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and next thing you know, they're in charge of things. Yeah, oh. So, practicalities. When people do say things you don't like, avoid Christian worry and conspiracies. I'm not worried, I'm just concerned. <laughs> people, worry is a sin. It really is. Worry is a sin. Worry is misplaced prayer and meditation. The Bible tells us to pray and meditate on the word. And if we pray and meditate on the promises of God, we're not going to be worried. We might be in danger, but we're not worried. Voting is good, but it's not going to save the world. I encourage you all to vote along biblical principles as best you can. But guess what? It's not going to fix everything. We need to fix people's hearts. There needs to be a transformation. You can't force people to be like you. If we just get 51%, we'll force the other side to do what, uh, what we want them to do. People, it's not going to work. We need to tell people about the Lord and tell people about the real truth and transform their hearts and have them be led by the Holy Spirit. That's what's going to change things. Reestablish your faith in God's rule. God is in charge. Wendy and I had a wonderful friend who just passed away a couple years ago, Eberhard Hofmann. He was my Gamaliel in some ways. He was one of my mentors. I wanted to be just like him when I grew up. He was a pastor in Germany, and we stayed with him, lived with him. Fantastic person. And he was a, a follower of the theologian Karl Barth. And Karl Barth, uh, we pronounce Barth, but Barth. Karl Barth um, was a resistor during World War II and did all the right things, said all the right things. One of those guys who got it right, kind of a Gamaliel type. And he was on his deathbed, and he was surrounded by all of his students. And they said, oh, Carl, what are we going to do with you gone? And his, his quote was, es wird regiert, and then he died, which is God's in charge. God's ruling. Stop worrying about things. God's in charge. God is ruling. And God will have his way with his creation. Is it going to be easy between now and then? Absolutely not. Will there be tribulation? Absolutely will. Is there going to be challenges for all? The more faithful we are, the more challenges we're going to face? Absolutely. I think we're heading into a... I, I hesitate to predict the future, but I think we're heading into a really crazy time for the next few years. And the difference isn't going to be who does better and who does worse. The difference is going to be who's going to be faithful during that time. Who's going to stick to the truth? Who's going to be doing what we need to do, saying what we need to say, no matter what happens? That's going to be the differing, differentiating thing. Now, I could, I could be wrong. We could be heading into a time of peace, prosperity, and wonderfulness, but it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> doesn't feel like it, you know, where there's all roses and unicorns. and what, what, What's that saying? Where the, anyways... So, be teachable, but not gullible. Do you understand the difference? Be teachable, but not gullible. Be willing to be wrong about things. I wish more smart people had intellectual humility. Oh, this is settled science. People, the whole idea of science is it's not settled. That's the whole idea. You're supposed to test everything. You're supposed to have other ways of thinking of things and go after things. Be teachable, but not gullible. Admit that we might be wrong from time to time. I just wish during COVID somebody had said something like that because everybody was so sure about everything, no matter which opinion they had. It's just the way it is. Well, truth is, I don't think any of, I don't think anyone understands COVID. It was weird. It went all over the place and didn't go in a straight line and it's just odd. Oh, it's exactly this or it's exactly that. And I'm thinking, how do you know? People, I know, three mu I know three times as much as I did when I was 20. But when I was 20, I thought I knew about 75% of what was going on, and now I, know it's, <laughs> now I know that even though knowing three times as much, it's like 3% of what's going on. A little intellectual humility would be a really good thing. And I think our country could use some, because everybody is so sure about their opinions. I'm just thinking, okay, right. 
Seek truth without your ego and side with it. Continue to seek after truth. Our men's group, we go after truth every Monday morning, and it's a free-for-all going for it. Coast to coast, including Canada, it's been fantastic to be a part of that. And we are truth seekers, and we try to learn from each other. It's not a, it's not a I want to tell you this thing. It's more like, here's what the Bible says. How can we figure out what it's really trying to say? The more I study the Bible, the more I give up my theology. I don't think God's impressed with our theology. People think if you really get into the Bible, you're going to become a legalist. No, you're not. You're going to become a Holy Spirit person because you're going to realize the Holy Spirit's in charge. And the Bible is full of tension and paradox and all kinds of things we can't fully understand, which is why we need to get into the Word. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, any big religious figure has been asked to write a systematic theology. Calvin wrote one. They all write one. Luther refused. Luther says there's no system in the Bible. It's full of tension like real life. He was asked questions, can you lose your salvation? Yes and no. There's tension there. There just is tension. You can't just take one side in there. You've got to look at the whole Bible. And I love that. In the Foursquare Church, one of our, one of our phrases is, let the whole Bible interpret the whole Bible. Don't just pick one verse and see the whole thing through it. Look at the whole thing. Be willing to suffer in the short term for being blessed in the long term. That's hard for us because we are so comfortable in Orange County. Even people, we live in a county where street people have iPhones. I mean, this, it's amazing where we live. And we are so comfortable. And we have access to so much food and so much everything in perfect weather. Suffering is not something we're real used to. We have to be willing to suffer for the name of Jesus. They were rejoicing for suffering in the name of Je- for the name of Jesus. For the truth that they saw him come out of the grave. That's kind of a big deal, and they're worth definitely willing to die for it. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. Luke 12, verse 32. Have no fear. Don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. The little flock, he's talking to the people who are faithful, the remnant. Have no fear, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is the church in Oberwinter where Wendy and I lived in 1988-89. Thank you. Back in 88-89, where I was going to grad school in Bonn, the school of Karl Barth, by the way, where he used to teach. And uh, this was the little church we went to, the Evangelische Gemeinde Oberwinter. And uh, little church, Wendy joined the choir and ended up learning German, the whole thing. And uh, we had a great time, lived in a little village on the Rhine. Son was baptized there at that church. And this is a, a place that was, we made all of our friends there. And they started every worship service. Uh, Holger Dümke would go up to the, the podium and he'd say this. Unsere Hilfe steht im Namen des Herrn. Our help is in the name of the Lord, der Himmel und Erde gemacht hat, who made heaven and earth. Der Bund und Treue hält ewiglich. He keeps his covenant and his faith in us forever. Und der nicht preisgibt das Werk seiner Hände and never abandons the work of his hands. That's trust in the sovereignty of God. And that's what we as the faithful remnant need to cultivate in ourselves. Let's pray.